Um, I guess my, most of my presentation is about what we do at home. Um, it's not a Yalgo marketing exercise, but I guess I have to demonstrate what we're doing to, um, to show where there might be some gains that you guys might be able to get in your businesses. Um, there's probably a seed stock uh, bias in the room in, t in, in terms of who's here. Um, but my presentation is probably equally um, aimed at the commercial man. But in reality, what's good for the egg is good for the chicken. So um, today I'm going to discuss why we, we need to produce economically better genetics at a minimum rate of 2.2% per annum. My job is then to de demonstrate to you that it's possible to do much better than that 2.2%. And in reality, it needs to be more, uh, more than that keep our commercial guys in business, our commercial clients in business. If we're not uh, reaching around that two and a bit percent, uh, we're, we're removing, removing an important tool for our commercial um, clients to stay ahead of declining terms of trade. In my opinion, the days of producing sheep uh, for the lifestyle are over, and I see it as a call, call to arms for seed stock breeders. And if we're not winning the battle, uh, next year we'll have one less client uh, who needs to sell up and change enterprises um, to alleviate, alleviate the cost price squeeze. Uh, regarding my presentation, there's two parts of it. So I'll talk to a PowerPoint for most of it. There's quite a bit of data in there and modelling. All the modelling is done on a sheep flock similar to ours at home. So I guess if you can look at the, rain, uh, the, the rate of gain rather than concentrate on the, the numbers uh, so much. Um, if you want to scrutinise the spreadsheet, we can do that later. Um, but if you run with, the, run with the numbers for me, it's more, more about uh, yeah, what we can do rather than the exact numbers. Um, in terms of maximising, in terms of what I'm going to talk about quickly, uh, we'll talk about the facts revolved around declining terms of trade, uh, the issues that are compounding it. Um, the fact that we really need to address income through a genetic grain gain to alleviate declining terms of trade. Proof of, it, of this concept through basically what we've done at Yao Gu and how we've been able to get a little bit more than that 2.2%. And also what it's costing us in terms of taking, we're taking a very narrow, uh, I guess, profit driven for our enterprise focus. And uh, I guess it's important to look at what it's costing us in some other traits. First of all, looking at declining terms of trade, um, you guys have probably all seen this graph. This is basically uh, demonstrate what's been happening in agriculture since the end of World War II. The orange line is the prices we've been paid, and the blue line is the prices that we've received as farmers. Uh, that line separating at 2.2% per annum. Um, if we look at it closely, we can't do a lot with the what. Well, the prices, um, with our cost prices, a lot of them are fixed and beyond our control. I see this graph, the biggest issue is a lack of productivity. And genetics is obviously a big part in alleviating that. So, uh, as we could see, low productivity, it's been, com sorry, to declining terms of trade are being compounded by low productivity in agricultural Agricultural productivity has dropped by a third in the last 12 years. Uh, any growth that happened, well, it's happened in the cropping sector. Uh, the worst performing has been the sheep, sheep and the beef, and the worst of all has been the wool industry, which I'm obviously heavily invested in. Why the lag in merinos, uh, in my opinion, is that there's more perceived profit drivers in the merino industry, which means there's more profit diluted, diluters and there's lower selection pressure on the things that drive profitability in businesses. There's a lower prevalence of data collection in incorporated technologies, which has been uh, backed up by some of Luke's stuff that we just saw in the merino industry. Uh, there's a high use of subjective selection and chasing trends and rainbows. So I guess what I'm, I'm here to challenge you guys and, and you guys to me as well is that how do we change the merino to stay ahead of inflation? and ensure that our commercial producers stay with us and prosper and grow their businesses. So if we can go back to the first graph, the declining terms of trade, uh, in my opinion, the income's the biggest issue. 
We need to inc inc uh, increase income substantially to alleviate the cost price squeeze. The strategy's got to be cost effective for the return of investment. Uh, and this is where I see a lot of the advantages of genetic gain versus this issue. They're cheap, they're profit profound, and they're compounding. So year on year they're compounding. The, the genetics in the background of your flock are compounding whether that be good or bad. And partly because I think we haven't made the production that we've wanted to over the last few years, there's plenty to capture in Moreno's. Uh, also, a lot of the issue, uh, cost issues with genetics are isolated from the, the cost issues we saw in declining terms of trade. Labour and those sorts of things can actually be allevi alleviated through genetics and technology. Uh, and it's also obviously a fast, fast growth industry. So generally, with most technologies, they get cheaper over time. Right, so with the income, where does the majority of the income come from a self-replacing uh, merino? Well, the modelling that I've done, as I said, it's very similar to our flock. So you'll see, the numbers you'll see um, address this issue, that the number of sheep we run, we shear every one of them every year, where we can only sell a maximum of 47% to remain self-replacing. So why don't we work on the greater, the greater percentage where we'll get the greater gain? That's, uh, this is just a graph to, this is a model uh, from the model flock that I had. Uh, as I said, if you want to have a look at that flock later, we can. But the prices used are uh, from independent commodity services. Um, so wool and meat prices, obviously, in there. So if we can accept that in average year, the greater majority of our income is coming from wool, um, why don't we set up a system where we can maximise that and maximise our income? So genetically, how do we increase fleece value? Uh, fleece value is predominantly made up of price. Or sorry, first of all, we'll concentrate on price. How do we maximise price? Uh, through fibre diameter. How can we guarantee a superior price? If we look at, it, look at this graph here, you guys might have seen this before. The green line is the long-term fibre diameter of the uh, national clip. If you can concentrate on the blue line, it's uh, two microns finer. It's, uh, the line indicates two microns finer than the national clip average. And the important thing to note is that that blue line has never been dis discounted. So two micron below the clip, national clip average, we've never received a discount for our wool uh, since 1980. So if we can accept that we need to be two microns finer than the average to, to maximise price, how are we going to maximise production? As, as Daniel told us earlier, price and production are antagonistic traits. So we want to capture both at the same time. We need to bend, bend the correlation between those traits. And I guess the most obvious example is uh, in the cattle industry, I think guys that were in there 20 years ago, if you wanted a bit of 600 day weight in your cattle, you were going to cop a fair bit of birth weight. Uh, now the, the beef industry is littered with animals that bend that curve and you're capturing the two major profit drivers in beef and you're capturing fertility and you're capturing weight. So let's get them both if we can. And this is why we came up with an index, a custom index for ourselves. It's very, very simple. Uh, it's basically all fleece weight and fibre diameter. We wanted to stay where we were for fibre diameter, but to do that, because there's an antagonistic um, correlation between those traits, we needed a fair bit of, in there, a fair bit of it in there um, so that wouldn't blow out with all that fleece weight in there. It's called the Y715. As it says, it was uh, designed to move our flock, commercial flock to a flock that cuts seven kilos of 15 micron. Proof of concept, so this is at a genetic level. Uh, this is our genetic trend for fleece weight and fibre diameter. We really hooked into this uh, index in 2012 and you'll see a steep rise in that line around that time. Now we start getting into some of the money, you know, the financial outcomes, which I think is why we're all here. The following graphs demonstrate uh, three different sheep populations. It's all our uh, ram and ewe weaner data in together. Put the ewe data in there because there's obviously a little, we sell rams, so they sometimes get a little bit different uh, management. But if we look at the phenotypic effect of these three drops, on the uh, y-axis, you've got fibre diameter, 
on the X, you've got police weight. Um, and I'll just quickly flick through the three of them and you can see how this population of animals has moved over three years. Each one of those dots is obviously represents a, an animal in that population. Uh, the red box, the significance of that, they're the sheep that are bending that curve. Uh, they're the productive fine animals. And as you watch the sheep population, they're all right, raw data measurements. It's moved across the screen and to the bottom. So for a summary of, of those three gra graphs, we've picked up $30 in fleece value in four years uh, on mean prices. And that's, that's through a function of uh, fibrodometer and an increase in fleece weight. More importantly, what sort of gain has that been in terms of the internal rate of return? It's been 11% per annum over our 7,000 sheep at Yaogu. If we were to extrapolate that over, if we could achieve that gain through our commercial flock, they're the sort of results you're going to be seeing. Uh, to get back to the box, in 2008 there's 18 animals. In the second drop, uh, 12, 2012 drop, there's 58. And in the 13 drop, there's 99 animals. So we're populate, populating that area with more productive sheep. This rate, with the compounding that's going on, um, my modelling was that we'd have the whole drop basically in there by the 2018 drop. Right, so back to the, in the issue of income. Uh, there's been an increase, income increase of $7.50 a head <coughs> per year. 11% per, compared to the 2.2% decline in terms of trade. We've gone a long way to solving the income issue. And it's been uh, increased by two factors. The fact that there has been a genetic gain, but much more importantly, it's been the rate of gain that's, uh, that, that's really driven the profitability in, the, in this flock. Uh, so this is, sort of, this is reflecting, I guess, the rate of gain that we've been able to achieve. Um, for fleece weight, we're predicted to get 4.34%. Uh, anyway, you guys can read the numbers. You can see that we've been ahead um, comfortably with fleece weight. I guess the fibre diameters basically maintained where it was, but I think there was a bias to me in terms of finding those outlier size for um, fleece weight. It's probably why we've jumped ahead a bit quicker in fleece weight. So the keys to how we've been able to achieve this uh, we've used in index-based approach. We've obviously used high-performance genetics, not just ours. We've found the best rams in the industry we can to drive this. It's a high ewe and ram turnover in the ram breeding nucleus. We, we turf out about half our uh, stud ewes every year, and the same with our size. Um, there's obviously been a lot of different trends in the merino industry over the years. We've sort of put up the shutters on that and st stick to what we thought we were on firm economic ground with. Uh, we've just incorporated a, a bit of genomics in it. Once again, we're trying to get our best bang for buck with that, but we obviously see it as an important part for us in the future. I think Luke touched on this. I don't see the point in us indexing all these in a good system you know, that's picking the most profitable sheep and then turfing them out for a, I don't know, soft muzzle or not a soft muzzle or whatever. Um, population genetics has obviously played a big part in it. We've got a large commercial flock behind our ram breeding nucleus. So we want to utilise all those sheep. Uh, all those sheep have proved themselves on the Algo index to remain in the, in the commercial flock. And we upgrade the top ones of those uh, into our ram breeding nucleus. I'll just whiz on. I see my time's running out. Um, yeah, I guess basically I'm saying that a lot of our most po uh, influential sheep have come out of these commercial ewes. So I see it really important to, to utilise those sheep. That gives you a bit of an idea of the index, the rate of gain we've been getting in the indexes. We've just got two slides to go, I think, or two or three, and these are probably the most important slides, I think, um, to demonstrate exactly you know, what sort of effect rate of gain has on, uh, has on a sheep flock. So I should have had the model flock there. The gross sales on the model flock uh, was about 720,000 or something. I think it's actually on the next slide. 
But what this uh, graph or what this table indicates, there's, we've um, applied four different indexes. Uh, three of them have the predicted gains, and then the last one is our index with the rate of gain we've been able to achieve. So you can see, obviously, that's, uh, that's the gross sales in year 10 after using that index. So there's not a lot in it from, from this flock between the MP and the FP. Uh, the AUGU index is going slightly better, so which demonstrates, you know, there's a little bit in terms of the index you use, but when you bring the rate of gain in, it obviously changes. It's the, it's the real game changer for our operation. In terms of internal rates of return, around that 2%, uh, you know, you, you're there or thereabouts in terms of declining, declining terms of trade. So, but you're going to have to be doing some pretty smart things outside your genetics to stay in business. Obviously, with the, in, with the index in our operation, um, you know, we're just ahead of there. But when we bring in all the selection procedures we do to ramp up gain, you know, we can be pretty ordinary managers and, and sort of still hang in there. So, I know wool's probably not been the most sexiest thing to talk about, but it's, you know, it's, we're pretty passionate about it and where, we're, where we can see we can make a lot of economic gain. But obviously we also want to see what it's costing us in terms of not having as much selection pressure on some of the carcass and fertility traits and things like that. Uh, the model flock, so what, what I've got here, obviously, well, that's pretty self-explanatory. But once again, you can see by using the DP index, uh, we've increased our uh, surplus sale per head significantly. We haven't done anything with Micron using the DP index, but we've got a little bit extra in fleece weight. Obviously, it's a fertility, highly uh, fertility orientated index. So you've got your 5% extra lambs there, which I hope you've got enough feed to deal with. Um, and then you can see in the gross sales in 10, year 10, you've had a modest income uh, increase in income. Uh, with our index, with the same flock modelling ahead uh, with the amount of gain that we've been able to achieve in the last 10 years. We've obviously, we haven't got quite there on the average sale uh, value. We've, got, we've increased it a little bit just through body weight. Uh, fleece weight's obviously where all the gain is, and that's statistically or numerically where all the numbers are. So that's it, once again, the area that we really wanted to concentrate on, because we shear every one of those sheep every year. Uh, and then you can see the gross sales, and, and excitingly, um, for this flock, that's the right index uh, to use in terms of internal rate of return compared to a DP index. Uh, so in summary, we can't improve what we, can't, what we don't measure. I think we need to cast as wide a net as possible to find the extraordinary sheep and breed from them. We need to identify the profit drivers. It's the algo's rate of gain in fibre diamond and fleece weight that's been driving profitability in our flock. Uh, and a very single focus, of, I guess, on those things to maximise them. We were, I guess we were comfortable that we were, uh, obviously a lot of people didn't, didn't think this was the, the right way to go genetically, but we were comfortable on historical wool prices and um, the amount of gain we might be able to get in there, that it was, a, it was firm economic ground to really put a lot of pressure on. We've kept it simple and we've stayed focused on what we're doing. And the rewards have come, yeah, I guess quicker than a lot of people would suggest in genetics. So that's me done. Sorry, I sort of rushed. Joe, your rate of gains are really good. Uh, I guess the, if I asked a show of hands if everyone was happy with their rate of gains, we wouldn't get many people saying yes. Uh, what would you see as the opportunities you have in the future to increase them even more? Well, I think um, some of the outside looking at other businesses, the where they've been getting really good gains. They've been through novel approaches. They've been through casting an, an extra wide net, uh, going into the marketplace, buying a lot of sheep uh, for a trait, and then you know, using a, a, a different ram source that's you know, maybe a lot finer or something else, and, and blending them together and finding those extraordinary sheep and, uh, and, and breeding from them. You know, there is obviously ASBVs and indexes of the way that we, we get gain, but there's no doubt there's other ways um, to do it, 
but you need to you know, spend a lot of money and, and do those sorts of things. Obviously, genomics is the one that uh, we're all interested in and we hear about all the time. But um, yeah, I think with genomics, it's, it's important uh, in our sheep industry operation, the fact that we can choose sheep before we've measured all the traits. You know, so we're decreasing interval in that. Hi, Jock, are you using mate's help? No, no. Well, there's an opportunity. Thanks, Anne. Um, I just wondered, Jock, given the poor accuracy in a lot of merino flocks, how easy is it for you to actually find size outside Yalgu to um, improve your genetic gain, find the size you want? Um, I guess without naming names, it's probably, you know, the, and the, the flocks that we go to are ones that have uh, are pretty good ac accuracies. Um, they're long-standing members of sheep genetics. They test their rams in soil evaluations, weather trials. Um, yeah, and, and we're pretty happy with the data that we're, we're getting out of those uh, flocks. I don't know what percentage of merino breeders are on sheep genetics now. It's probably last time it was around 30%, but by Daniel's numbers or Luke's, whoever it was, it looks like there's some growth there. So, I, get, I mean, the obvious issue for anyone coming on to sheep genetics has been the problem of not having the pedigree and stuff behind them. So that really turns people off because when their sheep go on there, they have a marketing issue. So I don't know if genomics is going to be helpful in that. I'll probably change the topic a bit, but <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't. We we we're very comfortable with where we with the accuracy of the rams that we're using from outside yeah, at the moment. Um, just back to the slide um, where you talked about casting the net wide, and you had your nucleus flock, and your six thousand commercial use. Yep. Can you talk a little about how you bringing sheep back in from yep. out of your commercial mob? So what we do, um, we collect so stable strengths in our index. That's the only um, trait we don't collect off those commercial sheep. But all the ewes get uh, an EID in them at landmarking. Um, they all come through the shed. We capture fleece weight, fibre diameter, body weight. And we use CV as a um, in instead of stable strength due to the correlation. Uh, and then those ewes get ranked from one to 3,000 on the Algo index, top 100 or 200 of them are eligible for the nucleus, uh, then we keep the next 1400 or whatever, and then the rest are surplus, so, yeah. I mean, ideally, you know, what the best way to select those sheep would be with a, a just a four trait sort of genomic card, a cheap one that we could do all those with, so we can actually get some lifetime performance predictions rather than you know, I guess at that young age, there's a bit of variation from those things like birth type and, and all those sorts of things. But um, I think it's the best we've got at the moment, for, for the money we spend anyway. <laughs>